What would you do if God came to you with an instruction you didn't want to do? How would you react? Would you tell him no? Try to run away from him? Denounce your faith? Would you obey because the God of heaven who's asked you to do something is the one who runs your life and that you have chosen regardless of how hard it is or that you don't want to, you do it anyway because obeying God is the one thing? Would you believe that his powerful wisdom, maybe he knows something you don't know? And that it's going to be better for you in the long run, better for you, better for others. You love people that much. Now that's all of these pieces of this story. I've been reading through the Bible since Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 in the beginning. And I've reached the book Jonah. Now Jonah is a an action-packed, powerful, explosive four chapters. The book of Jonah has all kinds of things to say about the love and grace of God and about how much he loves us, about how much obedience means to him, about what he's willing to do to chase us down when we when we f decide not to follow him, how he disciplines children when they're disobedient, how he turns from wrath when he feels as though a heart change has been made. It's amazing what all we find out about the character of God. And the, the, the thin crimson cord of God's love for us, this love letter that is the Bible. And so I want to take you over kind of a high altitude flyover of this book, the entire book. Because I think you'll be blessed about what it is that I was blessed about. I love this book. Now, if you want a deeper, um, a, a more in-depth teaching, I taught this at Waypoint. And each chapter has a full teaching to it. Let me know by email or message or whatever, and I can send them to you uh, via an email. They're audio files. Jonah is a prophet of God, and he lives in the northern kingdom of Israel. He has been working, he's been kind of a rock star, quite frankly. He's mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25. And he's kind of a rock star in the area, and so he's... He's been listening to God and doing the things that prophets do. And so far, he's, as prophets go, they, they tend to know him pretty well. And he's got statue and stature in, in northern Israel. Well, God tells him, he comes to the story and he asks him to do something that Jonah's not very happy to do. And we see kind of a, kind of a radical way of handling his discontent for this this action. We see and we read in chapter 1, verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, and so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And so God comes to Jonah, and remember that God knows man's heart. He knows what's in him. And so he comes to Jonah, and he tells Jonah, I need you to go to the capital city of Nineveh. That's the capital city of the most prevalent, most powerful, most wicked people in the world at this time, the Assyrians. It's in modern-day Iraq. And he says, go and profess, go go." pronounce them my judgment against them because of their wickedness. It's come before me and I need to do something about it. Now there's a good bet that Jonah, like most other Jews in the northern kingdom, don't like the Assyrians very much because the Assyrians have been coming against them. They've been coming down and taking their people away. We find out based on um, the writings of other prophets that because of northern Israel's sin against God, he uses the Assyrians to judge the to judge uh, Israel. And Israel is taken captive and dragged back to Assyria, in, uh, back to Nineveh and, and the surrounding areas. And so 
So Jonah is not too happy about this. We know that the Assyrians are tremendously wicked. They're, they they wrote down very heavily in their writings and in their wall drawings and that they were a torturous people. They created and started the heavy use of of the um, crucifixion, of the action of crucifixion. And although Rome perfected crucifixion at the time of Jesus, we're talking 800, 750 to 800 years before Jesus. They believed that if you lifted bodies, you had to lift the dead off the earth so that the earth would not become defiled. But there's plenty of readings about being impaled on spikes, being castrated, having your body parts ripped off, taken out, you're removed off your, your skin, set on fire, sacrificing children and other things. They used to put hooks in the jaws of their people to drag them back to see a wicked, wicked people. And no doubt Jonah doesn't like these people. Most likely he's had loved ones who maybe have been killed or tortured by them. And so when God comes to them testing his heart and saying, I need you to go to Nineveh, and I need you to go and pronounce against him, walk into the middle of that people you don't like so much, Jonah rebels. What do we see? Instead of going 500 miles to the east, where Nineveh is, they, he jumps a boat and goes 2,500 miles west to Tarshish. is the city that's believed to be the furthest place that man exhibited that man knew about at the time the farthest some people believe Tarshish was on the western coast of Portugal or Spain so he he the God comes to him and says I need you to get up and go and he doesn't he gets up and he goes the other way he buys a boat he gets into this boat and he hands off verse four but the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea. And so the ship was about to be broken up, a severe storm. And then the mariners were afraid. And every man cried out to this God and, and to his own God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. <laughs> now, we went down to Joppa. Most likely, the maritime guys in this ship were most likely Phoenicians. And we find out that Phoenicia... Uh, Phoenicians were all along the uh, coast of the Mediterranean Sea, the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And we, we learn about, in the Bible, about cities called Tyre and Sidon. We learn that Jesus heals a Phoenician lady. Uh, her daughter has a, a demon. So we know that they're pagan. They're not Jewish people. Um, they're very good on the, on the water. They're on the Mediterranean Sea all the time. Uh, fishing communities is what they are. And so these men don't know God of the Bible. It says here that they cried out to their gods. They, all these maritime guys are afraid. Now, they, they spend all the time on the water, and they're afraid of this storm. And so now they're calling out to their own gods, seeking uh, help. And they're throwing everything over sea. That can tell, that'll can tell you how these, these professional men that are on the ships all the time, how they're reacting to this storm. Jonah, on the other hand, uh, had gone down into the lowest part of the ship and uh, and had laid down, and he was fast asleep. And so the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us, so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for, for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. And so they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? For what is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? And so he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. These guys do something called casting lots. It's uh, Nobody knows exactly what it is, but it's believed to be an ancient game much like um, drawing straws. And so the way that it works is, is with yes and no questions, the Lord will providentially lead you to picking the correct answer. We see, we see the uh, casting lots, which is kind of like dice, really. Um, and the, Urim, the Umim and the Thumim, which is used by the Hebrews to do the same kind of a thing. It's on the, on the ephod of the priest. Yes or no questions, God providentially leads you to answering the question. And so when he they cast lots and they find out that the lot falls on Jonah. They ask him who he is. Where are you from? What's going on? Who are you? They didn't know. He bought a boat. He bought a ticket and got on the boat and they left with him. 
He said, I am a Hebrew and I, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven. He, he says who he is. <clears throat> and he says, he, uh, my God is the God of the Bible. That's he just simply says, this is where I am from. But look at the reaction. Verse 10, then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to them, why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And then they said to him, what shall we do that the sea may calm, uh, be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. And then the sea will become calm for you. And for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Jonah is no fool. He knows that this crazy storm that just showed up out of nowhere is because he's running from the Lord. God is a God, is a father, and he is a good father to his children. Jonah is a child of God. And so he's, so God is chasing after Jonah in an effort to get Jonah to repent. And he knows that this storm is trying to stop him from getting away. Interestingly enough, these Phoenician men who who serve other gods are now are now exceedingly afraid of a god of the Bible. And he's they were exceedingly afraid. They find out that he is he is a prophet of God. They they apparently know something about God. And they're not they're not they're afraid. Why would you ever bow down to a God that's not, that, that doesn't bring the power. Uh, other than God, there are no other gods. All other gods are just wooden statues made of gold and silver and whatever, and they don't do anything. God, God talks about it all throughout the, through the, the, the Old Testament, as I've been reading through the prophets and the historical books that there's no God but the God of the Bible. And these Phoenician guys seem to see this. They see the power of the Lord of the Bible and they say, what can we do to, to kill this, this thing because we're going to all perish? And Jonah, instead of Jonah saying, well, let me repent and turn around and take me back so I can deal with the Lord. He's so hateful and so hurtful about the Assyrians. His heart is so dark and so hard about the Assyrian people he hates so much that he tells him to throw him in the water. Just kill me. And then that'll take care of you and that'll take care of me. I'd rather die than have to go and follow and run away from the Lord. But Jonah knows he can't get away from the Lord. We, we read that in Psalm 139, verse 7. It says, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make a bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. That uttermost parts of the sea is the furthest place I can go on the sea. Tarshish at this point, that's where he's trying to go. But he should know that he can't get away from the Lord that's asked him to do this. And so he decides to take death instead of repentance. That's a hard heart when you're stuck in that place. But God continues to work in this situation. Look what it says, verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. And so they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. And the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. You have these men who are fearful of their life. They're asking how to handle it. Jonah says, throw me in the Bible and throw me into the ocean and the water will be calm. I got to tell you, in my flesh, I would immediately pick him up and throw him, no questions asked because I don't care about him. I care about me and my men, especially when I find out that he, he deserves it because he's somehow running away from his God. And well, I don't believe in his God anyway, but... Nevertheless, they have compassion on him. They still try to get the boat to land, not wanting to kill this, not wanting to kill Jonah of innocent blood. And so he tries, but it doesn't work very well. And so he finds himself, they find himself um, struggling. So they, they pray to God, the God of the Bible. And they say, forgive us for this. And they throw Jonah overboard, uh, which is amazing. And when they see the sea stops its raging in an immediate instant, 
Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice in the Lord and took vows. They believed in God. They turned their hearts towards God. They turned their hearts towards the God of the Bible. That's what you need to do now. Turn your heart towards the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved from your sins. That's basically what they had. They became disciples of God. They turned away from their own gods that didn't help them and turned towards God that proved himself faithful in this situation. Well, now Jonah's in the Mediterranean Sea. And it says in verse 17, the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, this is a sticking point, a contention of this story. Because most people don't believe that a, a fish could be big enough to swallow a man. Most people believe that this may be a whale. But I want to tell you that there is a, a Hebrew word for whale. There's a Hebrew word for sea monster. And there's a Hebrew word for fish. And fish is the word that's used here. No words are mistaken in the Bible. And when you go back and study the uh, the language used as it was translated from the Hebrew, we're talking about a big fish. Now, now the Jewish historians believe that a big fish, one big fish was created on 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 like day four or day five of the creation story, and it was only laid there to swim around and get really big. And be ready to swallow Jonah at the time God needed him to do so. It is that one, of course, you can't you can't prove, but that's what the Jews believe. Now we know that in in studying the fossil records that there were fish that they were that big. There are fossils of fish that could easily swallow people. So do we do we discount anything the Bible says about what God is? No. Every word of this book is God's word. It is influenced by the Holy Spirit and we know it to be true. The minute you start to cut and paste and remove words from the Bible and change the narratives to fit your own belief system is the time you start to deny the authority of God's word. <clears throat> be careful about that. A big fish ate Jonah. I'll show you some proof as to why Jesus believed that in a minute. So here's Jonah. He's in this fish. He's in it three days and three nights. It's, it's, it's especially important to remember that he's in there three days and three nights. Verse, uh, chapter 2 start, opens up with Jonah praying to God in the midst of his being swallowed by a fish. Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the, and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and all your waves passed over me, and then I, then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Yes, I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even my soul, and the deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains and the earth that his bars closed behind me forever. Yet you brought me up, my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you, into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So Jonah comes, he repents. He, sees, he comes to God, he cries out and he says, you've put me in this place. I understand you're punishing me. I am in the darkness. You have sent me to Sheol, which is hell. I know that this is a difficult place, but I remember you. I will apologize. I will repent. I will turn away from my sins and I will sacrifice my life once again to do what you've asked me to do. In a nutshell, that's what he has said. Something you need to do now if you haven't called upon the Lord to save you from your sins. Now he's expecting to die. He's expecting to be swallowed by a fish and to die in this place. But he's, he's repenting in the last moments of what he thinks his life is. But God is powerful. And God has made this fish to swallow him only to bring him to repentance so that he could do something else. And we see that in verse 10. So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. So now he was in the he's in this big fish three days and three nights. He has repented of his sins. He has rededicated himself, at least in theory. We don't know where Jonah's heart is, but God knows his heart. We know that God will see us her heart, and he's so patient, long suffering, he's so willing and merciful to give us another chance that he gives Jonah another chance. And the, he, he commands this giant fish to vomit him out, and he is end up on the beach. 
Now, what would you do if, if you were ordered by God to do something, you told him no, you outright disobedience, you ran the other way, and you have, now you have repented of your sins, what would you expect God to do? Would you expect God to change the change the rules? Do you think he would change what he wants to do? Do you think that he would tell you to get lost and take a hike? You're off the team. Do you think he would cast you off the island? Do you, what would you think he would do? Well, now God is not a God who changes his mind. He has his plan set up and he has a plan for a reason. And so what does he do? Well, we pick it up in chapter three, verse one. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. And then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now remember, God told them to go and tell them they needed to turn away from their wickedness because God wanted to judge them. Jonah doesn't want them to be saved, and so he first off ran away. Well, now he's been given the same exact instructions again, and so he obeys this time, but he goes in there and teaches in exactly a, 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 a nine-word sermon, a nine-word message. He doesn't talk about the fact that they need to repent from their sins, stop from their wickedness, the Lord will be merciful, all these things that we want to we want to hear somebody teach about the love of God and the, the love of Christ. He doesn't want them to he does say he wants them to die. He wants them to be destroyed because of their wickedness. And so all he says is, is yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. He doesn't talk about God. He doesn't talk about sin. He doesn't talk about wickedness. He doesn't talk about any of that. He's walking around, most likely yelling in Hebrew. Somebody probably in Assyria and understands Hebrew, knows that he is he is a Hebrew and he believes in the God of the Bible. The Ninevites may very well believe that God is that powerful. And so God supernaturally and providentially brings them to a place that Jonah is trying to keep them from going to by not being full, fully uh involved in this message. This really short message doesn't really say anything except you have 40 days and you'll be blown up. You'll be destroyed. It doesn't say how you can get away from it, how you can avoid it, but God can use the words. If you have a question about what to say, just say what, what comes to your heart. Just get involved and speak the word because God will use what you do and say in so many different ways. Look what happens, verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God. <laughs> these nine words, these nine words. And the Ninevites, who don't believe in God, believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And when the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne and laid aside his, his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, and do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that in his hands... Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? The king put out a proclamation of repentance. He doesn't even know what repentance means. But in his heart, he believes that if God, God may very well turn away from judgment. And if he does, maybe he saves the whole place. And so he orders everyone to put on sackcloth, cry to God, repent of their sins, and seek the God of the Bible. This is amazing. Because Jonah didn't want this to happen. He never said anything about it. But we know that God's word doesn't return void. We know that God's word gets out and comes back. It, it assumes that it will be it, that it will that it'll have the effect God wants it to. It says so in Isaiah chapter uh, fifty-five. That when I send out my word, my word doesn't come back having not accomplished anything. My word went out and it made these people turn away. And our loving God, look what happens, verse ten. Then God saw their works. And they turned from their evil ways and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not 
do it. He did not destroy the city. 40 days and you will be overthrown. Didn't happen because they had repented from their wickedness and God had changed their mind. So but as we're going into chapter 4 here, Jonah is not very happy about that. Look what it says, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he became angry. And so he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I had said when I still was in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish. For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. He's so angry. Remember, he, he didn't want to go to the wicked Assyrians. He didn't want him to be saved. So he ran away. Then God chased him down and God gave him a second chance. So he comes in and he, he just kind of blurts out these nine words here that don't have a whole lot of value in them. But God makes value come out of anything. He can bring water out of a rock. And so these people get saved. He is a God of mercy. And he turns his wrath again away from this king and these people because they humbled themselves and turned to him. Well, Jonah didn't want them to be saved. That was the point. And we see something about this conversation he has in one when he runs away. He says, didn't I tell you that this is what you were going to do? Didn't I tell you that you're a merciful and gracious God and that if I was going to go over there, you were going to save him? And I don't want that. And I don't want to be a part of that. And I don't want to be known as the, as the prophet who saved the Assyrians. Kill me now. That's what he's saying. See, he, ne he never saw the heart for other people. He never saw the heart as God sees other people. In, in a time when racial craziness and ethnic craziness and woke stuff and all this other stuff, when all this is going on now, do you have the heart to see the other side? That's where Jonah falls short and God needs to prove and, and make a point. That's why he called Jonah in the first place to change his heart for people he didn't like. Because God has created all men in his image. Well, in verse 4, it says, And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? G God doesn't even strike him down. God says, is, is, Do you have the right? I'm God. I can do anything I want to. And I called you to do something special. And it happened. And you're a part of history. But you, you're you mad. <laughs> is he, do you have the right to be mad? And, and so what he does is, is he takes this big, huge, gigantic situation that Jonah is just kind of mad about, seething about. Look what it says. Jonah went out of the city and he sat on the east side of the city. And there he made himself a shelter and he sat under the in the shade till he might know what would become of this. He's still waiting for the city to be destroyed. He's, he went out outside the city and he sat down. He built a little hut for himself to get out of the sun. And he wanted to watch to see if God was actually really going to relent and be merciful or if he's going to destroy the city. So God, knowing that Jonah is not quite getting it, he, his heart is still hard towards the Ninevites, and now his heart is angry for what God has done, kind of takes this huge situation and he makes it very personal so that Jonah would see it. It says, it, it says that, uh, so Jonah went out and he went to the city, and the Lord, verse 6, uh, God prepared a plant, and he made it come up over Jonah that it might shade him and his head from the delivery of, from his misery. And so Jonah was very grateful for the plant. He's grateful for this plant, but he's not grateful for the opportunity to save hundreds of thousands of people. <laughs> but as morning dawned, and the next day, God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. And when he wished death for himself, he said, is it better for me to die than to live? And God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? But the, uh, <clears throat> And he said, it is right for me to be angry even to death. Jonah, he's, he's still searching Jonah's heart. He makes this plant. Jonah doesn't do anything with this plant. It comes up. It gives him mercy. It gives him, it gives him shade. He's grateful for it. He appreciates it. But then God kills the plant. And now Jonah's mad about this plant. He's still not mad about the idea that that all these people, he still wants all these people destroyed, but he's mad about a plant, so shallow. But here's what God says. He says, but the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored or made it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. Should I not have pity on Nineveh, the great city in which 
are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock. This point, 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left are most likely children that don't know evil. They don't know wickedness. This city could have easily had 120,000 children under the age of, under the understanding age, infants and, and toddlers. God doesn't want to destroy the innocent with the wicked. He doesn't want to destroy all the livestock and the animals either. That's not his heart. His heart was to get people to turn towards him and turn away from wickedness, to follow the rules that are here in this book. Jonah doesn't understand that the very point of all of this was that he could have walked in and saved, quite frankly, a, probably a million people in a, in a, three, in a city that's a three-day walk across. So awesome. God, God calls us to do things and he puts us in positions to teach us what we need to know about his heart, about other people, about that all people are made the same, that he has a heart for everyone the same. He doesn't wish for all people to be destroyed. He wants everyone to repent and come to him like, like these wicked Ninevites did. And he will, he will call up, if you call upon the name of the Lord and you believe that he is raised from the dead and you, and, and you believe you're a sinner and that you want to turn away from that behavior and activity, you'll be saved. Just like the Ninevites, the wicked. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past. It doesn't matter. If you turn away and give your heart to God, he'll, you'll be saved. Well, interestingly, this is a story that comes under tremendous attack because nobody believes that a fish was real. They believe it was an allegory, a story, a spiritual, a parable. Somebody didn't tell the truth about what it was. They blew it out of proportion. But, but the best way to, to prove the Bible is with the Bible. And so this Old Testament story, 700 years before Jesus Christ, is written here for our learning and our understanding about who God is, that God is willing to do those things. But we find out that even Jesus believed that story. Why? Because Jesus was in heaven at the time. He hadn't been a man yet. And so he was in heaven knowing and being a part of this story. And then when he's teaching in this situation, Matthew chapter 12, he refers to it. Let's check it out. Verse 38. And then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Now, these guys had seen thousands of signs. They knew, they knew that Jesus, they didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. They just wanted to be entertained. Jesus knew the heart of these men. He knew that it was fruitless and countless to do so. And this is, this is how he answers. But he answered and said, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He says, I'm not going to show you any more signs except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. What does that mean? Well, Jonah was swallowed by a fish. He was inside Sheol in the belly of the fish, left for dead for three days and three nights before being resurrected, vomited up on the Sure. Well, Jesus was killed on a cross, was buried in a tomb for three days and three nights before rising from the grave to everlasting life. It's the same story. And so he is saying, you understand the, the sign of Jonah. You understand the three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. You will know that I am the Christ, that I am the son of God. When I rise three days later from the death you create, that's what he is saying. Uh, very specific um pre, you know, pre-Messiah kind of a prophecy, but here's Jesus saying, it's, it's real, it happened. It happened, you know it happened, and so now I'm going to testify to it's happening. Jesus testified many stories using and quoting many, many Old Testament uh, verses because he is the author of the book. It verifies between the Old Testament and the New Testament how important he uses all Scripture to be. So if you're in a church that only counts the Old, the New Testament and discounts the Old Testament as being out of date, you're wrong. You're missing the entire counsel of God through the Old and New Testament together. 
Last thing before we leave, verse 41 says, The men of Nineveh, this is Jesus still speaking, the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with the generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater one than Jonah is here. He's speaking about Jonah came and saved the entire city of Nineveh. J um, Jesus is saying those people who repented, they're going to be in heaven. They repented of their wickedness and were saved. You'll know them and you'll see them in heaven at another time when we all come together at the rapture. He says Jonah was a great guy. He came in and he brought the message, but Jesus is a greater guy. He is the greater than Jonah, but they're both a picture of the same thing. Jonah came into a wicked place and made everyone repent and they turned away from their wicked sins and were saved. Jesus did the same thing. And it was backed up by the sign of the prophet Jonah. Three days and three nights in the belly of a fish. Three days and three nights in a tomb before rising from the grave. The Bible is so cool. And it is so powerful to illustrate to us our great need for a savior. We cannot do it on our own. We must seek after the wickedness that we follow, the sinfulness that we follow. We talked about it in the past. And we turn away and turn towards God to be forgiven of our sins. This is the most important decision we can make. Jonah ran away. We can't run away from God. You can't go anywhere that God is not there and he will relentlessly chase you down until your heart is, heart is so hard that he delivers you up to Satan himself. That's a scary place. If you're moved by this at all, any question at all, the belief in your heart of the word of God at all, if you have questions, then you still haven't found your place there. Read the scriptures and let it change your heart. I promise you, you won't regret it. Have a good week this week. Be blessed on this powerful story. Be blessed on the words of Jesus Christ. Be blessed on the blood that he has shed for us. Be blessed and know that God is looking down upon us to be a good father, even when we go astray. Be blessed this week and take care.